So for this next learning module, we'll see how to get started on problem 7.16, which is actually going to be on your final exam, which will feel a lot like a homework. We have a distributed load uh, placed across a beam with a pin reaction at A and a roller reaction at B, and we want to uh, find the internal forces, forces at point C. And the one thing I want to point out on this is they say um, follow the sign convention here. And I'll show you for when you're entering answers into my lab uh, what they mean by sign convention. But if you happen to miss the sign convention, I will go through manually and look at your results. And if you're just off by a sign, I'll give you uh, credit because ultimately I would have to look at your work to see which direction you assumed for the uh, various internal forces. So uh, as I said in the last video, these all kind of work the same way. Step one, you just want to analyze the uh, equilibrium of the entire beam. And then basically partition add the internal forces and enforce equilibrium again. So it's kind of like you, you do a statics problem twice. Only one time you're doing it on a portion of the beam uh, that it contains your internal forces. And the reason you wouldn't do that directly is uh, in general, when you segment the beam, the two sides aren't statically determinant unless you know the reactions. And you can see that here. If you were to segment the beam at point C, each side would have three unknowns associated with the internal forces. Uh, as long as there's a reaction at, uh, at least with at least one unknown at A and B, you'd have a statically indeterminate case because you would have four unknowns with only three equations of equilibrium. So in order to enforce equilibrium of this body, I can just draw a free body diagram. And I notice that since A is a pin connection, it in general could have an unknown vertical and horizontal component. However, since this beam is loaded with no horizontal forces, I know that that is zero by the fact that the sum of all forces in the x direction must be zero. Uh, in addition, since B is a roller, I have an unknown vertical reaction at B. Now the question uh, becomes, how do I model the uh, force associated with the distributed load? So hopefully you remember back uh, when we inter originally introduced this concept in chapter four, that the way you do that is you compute both the centroid of the area formed by the distribution uh, in order to determine where the equivalent load is pace, placed, and you determine the integral of the distribution in order to determine the magnitude of the equivalent load. So the way that you want to uh, do it in this case, the easiest way to do it, is to model the distributed load as having a rectangular component and a triangular component. So I'll just do the rectangular component first. And the reason that you have to do that is if you notice, even on the left end of the load, before it increases, uh, that distribution has a value of 130 newtons per meter. So I'm going to draw this as a rectangular plus a triangular, which I'll show a little bit later. But the first thing that I need to do is to determine the magnitude of the equivalent force. And the way that I always get that is by integrating the density. In this case, since this beam goes from uh, x equals 0 to x equals 6, I'll integrate that uniform density from 0 to 6. But I know, since this is just a rectangle, that will just be 130 newtons per meter times 6 meters, which would be, what is that, 600 uh, plus 180, uh, 780 newtons. And I know that the centroid of this shape, since it's uniform, is just going to be half the width. So it's just going to be W divided. I want to be careful using W here because uh, maybe I'll call it span. Span divided by 2, which is just going to be 3 meters. So what that means is that I would get the same effect if I loaded this beam by this distributed load, or this is equivalent to a single load of uh, 780 newtons applied right at the middle. So uh, in my modeling, I can just draw in a 780 newton load applied right at the middle. So. I'll just show one of the uh, spans on the left, and you'll see why I did that in a minute. I know I still have to deal with the triangular part, and I know since the triangular part is fatter on the right, that uh, its centroid is going to be on the right side of this beam. So I want to keep this side uh, clean for now. So I'll model this uh, distribution as a rectangular part plus a triangular part. So the triangular part It's a good thing when you haven't committed yet, even if you don't draw it long enough, you can always fix it. So if you notice, this density goes from 130 
up to 260. So if you kind of subtract the uniform portion away, um, the triangular part you can view as going from 0 to 130. So if you do the same thing here, uh, determine the magnitude of the equivalent force, uh, technically it is the integral, but remember that um, for a case like a simple geometry of a triangle, you can just use formula for area under the curve, which will be 1 half times the base times the height. So the base in this case is just that span dimension. This triangle is uh, triangular distributed load is there over the entire six meters and the height is 130. So uh, if you do that math, what's that turn out to be? 390 newtons. So you're gonna have a 390 newton load. And in order to not do the whole problem, I'll make you look up <laughs> where the centroid is, but just know it's not going to be the midpoint. It's going to be over to the right side because uh, the, the density is, is larger on that, time, on that side. So that's kind of a, a question for you. So you're gonna add that in here, wherever it turns out to be. This is a distance that you can determine. Just be careful when you look that up in your text or if you know how to do it by um, computing uh, moments through calculus, make sure that uh, when you get whatever that number is, it's going to be a, a fraction of the base that you place this in the wrong part. Like if, if for example, it turned out to be uh, two thirds of whatever the base is, just make sure you're going two thirds from the right end of the beam. So just uh, that's one of the things that you need to do. So uh, once you have this set up for the equilibrium of the entire body, what I would do is find a y by summing all moments about point B. And you might ask, well, why did I pick a y? Well, I want all the forces at um, point C. So I technically only need to get one of the two reactions because once I have one of the two reactions, I can just go right away and draw the free body diagram of my segmented beam. So in terms of the rotation that's induced about point B, I will have um, a clockwise rotation associated with a y. So that'll be minus a y times the uh, perpendicular distance in that case is the entire span of the beam or six meters. That is going to serve to counterbalance the counterclockwise rotation of the equivalent uh, single load of the rectangular load, which has 780 newtons of magnitude and it is at a perpendicular distance of three meters. That entire span is three meters. Plus, we determined that for the triangular portion, the magnitude is 390, and you need to determine what that is. And since this is equal to zero, you'll know you're doing things right if you basically get a formula that looks like this. So fill in that gap, and you should be able to compute a y. So next, and by what I mean by this is kind of the second step of the problem, what you want to do is segment at C and draw a free body diagram. So if you draw a segment of this beam at point C, notice that you'll have the vertical reaction AY, which you saw for in the previous step. You're going to have all of your unknown forces. Now, when it said follow the standard sign convention, the way that the book traditionally does it, is for the left portion of the beam, they show the shear force going down and they show the bending moment going counterclockwise. Again, there technically could be a normal force in there, but we don't need to solve for it in this case because there is no horizontal loading that would induce a normal force. Now, the trick of this problem is you need to consider the effect of the portion of the load between zero and C now. So you wouldn't want to use the same representation. Like if you think about it, if you try to use the same magnitudes and locations of the representations of the entire distributed load, then what you would be saying is that the triangular portion doesn't even contribute to uh, any loading on this first portion of the beam, but you know it does, right? There clearly is a contribution of the triangular loading here. So what you need to do here, this is kind of the second part of what you have to do, to get these representations, repeat the distributed load analysis for half the length. Because if you think about it, this portion of the load only goes from zero to C, which is three meters. So you're going to want to draw in the rectangular distribution but rather than going all the way to six, it's only going to go to three. Um, helps to write in three correctly. So 
for the rectangular part, it's going to be applied halfway. So this is going to be um, 1.5. And you can get its, uh, its uh, magnitude relatively easily because if it has a we're at the same height, 130 newtons per meter. But if you only have half of it, three meters, the equivalent loading here is only going to be 390 newtons. So this is 390 newtons. So do the same thing for the triangle, but only include the base of three. And you might have to be careful how you compute this height from there, but I don't want to give that part of the problem away. But what you should find is that you got another load that is on more towards the right again. You need to determine what this distance is and what this magnitude is. But once you have that, just sum all forces in the y direction and set that equal to zero. And what you'll find is that you can solve for v directly because you'll know this, this, and this, so you can get the, and then sum all moments about point c and set that equal to zero. And you'll have the moment of uh, a. In the clockwise direction, you'll have the moments of these two forces in the counterclockwise direction, plus you'll have M. So what you what you would know here is you can get MC. It um, basically should be, uh, I don't want to tell you too much, but if you just look at, at what's going on, it's going to be whatever uh, portion of the clockwise moment of AY that isn't counterbalanced by these two moments, because these three are all working on the same team, right? They're all inducing counterclockwise rotations. So if it turns out that these are already too large relative to day Y, you might get M to be negative. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't computed yet, and uh, where I've been trying to talk and write, it's not immediately obvious to me what the sign of that would be. So uh, sorry about that. That's why we have static analysis. We don't have to kind of uh, do the inspection technique that we talked about for the zero force members uh, last week. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, hopefully it gives you a good setup for the problem on the uh, final exam. And good luck. Just email me if you have any questions on it.